Hey, everybody. Welcome once again to the Winning Digital Customers podcast. This is our first episode we are recording in 2022. So a brand new year, and we have a brand new awesome guest. Today I'm with joined by Stacy Sherman. Stacy is an extraordinarily recognized and accomplished CX leader. I can't go through the full list of her awards and accolades because we'd have no time left on the episode, but she was ranked a CX leader of the year, uh, finalist by my customer, one of the 33 most inspiring women in CX to follow. She was ranked one of the 20 global customer experience experts, one of the 25 top thought leaders of 2021 by ICMI and many, many other things. So widely recognized for her knowledge and expertise and the frameworks and original thinking that she brings to the world of customer experience. She also uh, previously was the head of some areas of customer experience at Verizon. She currently runs customer experience at Schindler Elevators and has a extensive background prior to that. So please join me in welcoming Stacy. Stacy, I'm so thrilled to have you here. I'm sure there's a lot we can get into. Is there anything you'd like to add to my uh, to the background that you think uh, people listening should know about you? Well, thank you for that, and Happy New Year. And I would just say that, like you, passionate to drive the movement forward and started a podcast as well, and I I love doing this. I love talking and helping to spread this movement in what we both believe in. So doing CX Right podcast, I hope people will listen. And Howard, you were on my show as well, which uh, is going to launch this year. So um, glad to be here. Well, again, thank you. Welcome. So, well, let's talk about that. Let's the movement. I love that. I do. I, I feel the same sometimes. I feel like I'm on a, you know, I'm like a evangelist for something. And frankly, I, I hate to sound naive, but after all these years of of focusing on customer experience and focusing on customer research, I still find it hard to believe sometimes, naive though it may sound, that everybody is not on board because it just seems like the the proof is in the pudding. The companies that focus and center on the customer and use the kinds of research techniques and design thinking techniques and journey mapping techniques that lead to customer centric outcomes, they almost always get the best results. So, and yet there still remains, I find so much resistance in the world to this type of approach. So I'm curious about, you you know, your experience, your thoughts about why is the movement so difficult? Well, first of all, it's not easy simply because it's not like e-commerce or a retail purchase, you know how much money is going in that cash register very easily. And e-commerce, credit card went through, online purchase done. CX is not like that. And it's it takes really a village, a whole company behind it, and then really getting smart how you use CX metrics to justify the investments in the tools and the people and and measurement itself. So that's the first thing I would say. I do believe from people like you and and others and myself that we are driving change slowly but surely. I think it's exponentially more than ever before. And to that regard, I'm going to share a pet peeve. A pet peeve that everybody is actually starting to claim that they're customer experience experts or customer service experts, but they're not. And it's the words are starting to become part of everybody's resume and everybody's LinkedIn. And that's a pet peeve because there's a real, there's a real practice to it and not everybody understands. Yeah. Well, you, you talk and I think the, you know, I know your website and I think the name of your podcast is Doing CX Right. I'd love it if you could just talk a little bit about that. I mean, there might be a lot of people out there that say they're doing CX, but they're not doing it quote unquote right. And now I never believe there's any one right way of doing anything, but there's certainly wrong ways <laughs> that I've definitely observed. But tell us about your thoughts about what is, what is the best way of doing CX right? First of all, it is asking customers what they really want. Too often, companies build products, market messaging, all from the inside, and they never validate or ask customers. So it's all within, 
And that is what I call doing CX wrong. Secondly, companies will also ask customer for feedback. They'll do surveys as one example, and they do nothing with it. That's another really don't waste customer's time if you're not going to close the loop. Likewise, I believe that measurement is essential. And for companies that never measured CX, customer satisfaction, or anything before, Net Promoter Score is wonderful as a way to start. But it doesn't get into the why. So NPS alone is not enough. And so that's another piece where I say get started, learn, but don't stop there. Continue to evolve. And there's many ways to do that. Yeah. And what do you think if someone's listening to you thinking, that sounds like me, you know, we, we keep a few key measures. We graph our net promoter score. We're happy when it goes up. We're sad when it goes down, but they want to go to a next step. What, what are some of the key next things to focus on to understand a little bit more about that? Why? So a couple of things. One, you actually want to meticulously ask customers at the right moments of truth. Where in the customer journey? If you're only asking them, for example, at the end of an interaction that might be two years long, well, you're missing so much in the beginning from when they onboarded to the middle of a contract, let's say. And so really understanding your customer's expectations and feelings, yes, the feelings word, throughout their journey and different interaction points is important. Again, you have to start somewhere, pick one, but then evolve it. Also, there's something that people don't realize, which is so powerful. And there's been a lot of discussion last year about this, but I want to emphasize again in this new year, which is Level of difficulty, friction, how easy or difficult is it to buy from you, to learn, to get set up? And that's something that a lot of brands don't do. They don't ask that question. And if the, if it's really difficult, let's say to even get help on the phone, customer care, customer service. Well, what do you think the NPS is? I'm not going to recommend you. And that's why. So that's another tip I I would recommend is really understanding the ease of use, the the level of difficulty to interact with your brand. Yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, And any particular um, strategies that you've seen be uh, best methods to to figure that stuff out? Is it it more about just surveying at individual points in time? Are there other techniques that you've used to give you the greatest level of insight? Absolutely. I recommend that you aggregate, and there's plenty of tools out there, aggregate the structured data, which is surveys, for example, and the unstructured, like social media and ratings and reviews, and aggregate it and then be able to prioritize the customer pain points and their happy points. Both. You want to know both. And looking at them in silos, which a lot of times companies are organized that way to drive silos. But when you bring it together, that's where the magic happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to ask you about your heart and science uh, framework and this idea. You've already mentioned emotion. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I do. I do think very often in business we can become, you know, very focused on dollars and cents and return on investment and the bottom line and what rings the cash register and feel like emotions are kind of, a, I don't know, kind of a soft topic and it's not really about feelings. It's about business. What does business have to do with feelings? Um, do you feel that way? Or <laughs> I'm guessing not. Uh, tell us a little bit about the relationship that you see between the heart and the hardcore things that people in business ultimately want their investments to yield, which is, you know, cash, revenue, profit. Yes. So first of all, it's so obvious in this great resignation timeframe that people are leaving where they're not happy. 
And why aren't they happy? Well, because leadership is not leading with their heart. They're not paying attention to and empathizing with their employees and listening and including and making them feel valued. And I'm saying these employees because it's the employees, it's the people that deliver to the customer. So they go hand in hand. And I believe that you have to, leaders have to lead differently. Um, I know Simon Sinek says leaders eat last. At the same time, I think we have to eat with and well, leaders have to eat too. So it's all the combination. And, and therefore, if you are leading with your heart and really sincerely care about your people, building trust, they do that in turn with the customer. And the science behind it are really those measurements at the same time, the internal NPS, other metrics to gauge how your employees are, their perceptions, their feelings, just like we ask customers. And you marry that together. And then you really have a a successful company that's differentiated. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. You know, uh, Tony Robbins says, the quality of your life is the quality of your emotions. And I think that's like just a, to me, that's like a very profound idea that like what else really matters in the end, you know, if you're happy, you're unhappy. And I think so much of our relationships, and I like the way you tie that into employees, you know, employees, they stay with company when they're happy and they leave when they're unhappy. I mean, on the one hand, that seems so, so obvious as to almost, why are we even saying that? But that's the point of emotions, right? When we talk about them, that's emotions. And the same thing with customers. If you can give someone a a beautiful, exciting, fun. I mean, there's so many positive emotions, right? It doesn't have to be any one particular one. Positive emotional journey, then they're likely to want more of that. And obviously to the degree that you mm. disappoint, anger, confuse, frustrate, or generate any of these other emotions, naturally, who wants to sign up for more of that? So uh, I totally agree with you. And yet it's it's a, another one of those things that's just amazing to me that we uh, we often have to persuade people of things that that sometimes seem obvious, but well, I guess that's... That's what we're here to do. Yeah. I want to just share something that I've been studying a lot over the past weeks, and that is all about trust. There's a gentleman that I interviewed, and I can't get him out of my mind, which his name's Charles Green, and he wrote The Trust Equation, and it's a real formula about building trust. The reason why I bring it up now is there's a piece of the formula, there's reliability, credibility, and intimacy. And that's not a word, intimacy, we talk about in business. And yet, when you build intimacy with professional intimacy with your employees and your customers, you really build trust. It's part of this trust equation. With trust, you have everything. If you make mistakes and they trust you, they're going to be more forgiving. So I I do recommend people think about and be very aware of how trustworthy are you and your brand. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's an important idea. Another great book on that topic is Stephen Covey's book. Uh, I think it's called business at the speed of trust or something about the speed of trust. But yeah, I found that book really like the, there's a core insight there that it kind of starts from the idea that, you know, there's always somebody trying to take advantage of you, but probably most people aren't. So you kind of can live your life either by, and as a business, make the same choices. You can live your life. You can run your business focusing on trying to make sure that nobody ever takes advantage of you, but at the risk of, alienating a lot of people who aren't trying to take advantage of you, but for whom you, ex- you, you make them feel not trusted. Or mm-hmm. you can accept that once in a while, probably someone's going to take advantage of you. But the huge upside of that is by being more trusting you, um, you wind up, like you said, like you just said, you know, it, 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 it creates more intimacy. Or if it doesn't create intimacy, at least it doesn't create a barrier to intimacy as, as distrust does. And, um, and that at least Covey's, 
perspective is that that, that's, that equation is so balanced in terms of the benefit that you get through trust that, yes, okay, someone, some, someone steals something from you or whatever else. Yes, that's going to happen. But the, the downside of that is so much less than the downside you get from the distrust that that, that is really the way to operate from a business perspective. And I think that's, that's key. And you're right, feeling distrusted is a key you know, negative emotion that, you know, is it's insulting when you feel dis- distrusted. And it also can, it's not hard to build trust. It really comes down to communication. For example, if you're waiting for a product and I have the choice, I can not call you and shield and hide because I don't have anything to say and it's out of my control or I can choose to proactively pick up the phone and tell you or email you, but I like the phone that I haven't forgotten about you and I'm working on it. I'm going to get back to you. Now you still may be mad. You need this thing, but I built trust that, you know, I'm taking care of it. I have your back and it matters. It's going to affect who you choose as a vendor, as a company to buy from. Certainly. certainly. Yeah, no question. Um, well, I, I'd like, like to try to dive into some specific examples now. Um, I know you've, you've worked with a lot of, a lot of different companies around customer experience. Um, what are some of the challenges you've encountered when trying to implement these types of principles in particularly because our audience tends to be people from large enterprises. So I don't know you've worked with some very, very large enterprises, including Verizon, which is certainly in the New York area. I think they're the number one largest company in the New York area. And of course, Schindler, I know, I think I, I think I read that you have, you move 1.5 billion people every day. <laughs> so um, That's a lot of, uh, that's a lot of people to move up or down or left or right or whichever way you're moving. So um, when you try to in, in, in talk about these ideas within large enterprises, I know you probably, you probably don't immediately get the, okay, how much, you know, the, here's an open checkbook. Here's our complete support. You know, what, what does it take to be successful? What, what, what challenges have you encountered? And tell us a little bit about if someone's trying to, someone says, you know, you're preaching to the choir, but how can you help me? Uh, you know, get uh, get the congregation on board. What what have you seen be successful for that? This is a big question, and I'm going to answer it as simply as I can. It takes time to build trust with your executive team, and everyone in the middle and the bottoms up. It takes time on why CX matters in every single role especially when you're not on the front line, the back office will often say, I don't touch the customer experience. And I'm like, yeah, you do. Let me explain how you do. So getting everybody rallied takes time. And the best way to get people to invest in programs and tools and resources is, my belief is pilot programs. And I'll say, let me show you the value. Give me a little bit of time. Here's what I'm going to do. And if they're easy, they're low hanging fruit, you know, just go do it. Sometimes you really have to go through change management process. But either way, I believe that if you test and show why something works, the more you have data, qualitative and quantitative, then The leaders will understand, like, this is not Stacy's view. This is what the customer said. And then you can scale. And that's always been at different companies I've been at. That's the way I've been able to drive the movement of where where I am with a team. Certainly, that's important. You can't do it alone. But how do you build a team? How do you build the investments? Test. Analyze, adjust, repeat. Yeah, yeah. No, well, that makes sense. You build enough trust to get enough rope, so to speak, to to try something, but where the inve- where the risk is low, and then once you've proven that works, I imagine you, you've not only get forward approval, but you've built more trust because you've demonstrated that these pilots 
uh, you know, can um, be successful. Is there an example that you could share with us where you've done that type of piloting? You know, some, some things, one of the things I've noticed with CX is some things are easier to pilot than others. You know, some things it's like, well, how do I, how do I figure out how to pilot it? You know, is it at one store? Is it with, within one customer segment? Is with this within one product line? Can you talk a little about some of the challenges of trying to figure out how to, how to prove something on a small scale that ultimately would have to be implemented on a larger scale? Well, the challenge is when the company organization is designed in a way where everybody is, again, very siloed and not seeing how they affect the customer experience. Or they have goals that are very different and not shared. So, for example, um, when I was at Verizon, the online e-commerce team had different metrics than the retail store. And same with other places I've been. Even as a consumer, I'll buy something from online. I'll try to go return it at the local store. And they'll say, sorry, I can't take it back. You didn't buy it at the store. You have to return it online. And I'm like, aren't you one company? <laughs> right. Why are you making this difficult for me? So that's something why I say it is so important. And I do think that the, that the importance of a customer experience team is to get to be the glue that bridges all these teams together because they're not going to do it by themselves. It's just reality. Maybe there's the desire, but it just doesn't happen so easily. So I believe that everywhere I've worked, it's bringing people together, helping them, even with their separate goals, understand, put themselves in the customer's shoes, and how do we make it better for them, and then work towards that. Yeah, I really like that metaphor of customer experience teams as glue because – you know, I, th I think it's this inevitability in business, especially a company of any size. You have to break up into teams. You have to have silos because it was like the Amazon two pizza rule. You know, like supposedly, you know, the best sized team to get anything done is no more than where the meeting, you only don't need any more than two pizzas. You know, that's supposedly Jeff Bezos' rule there. And, 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 but of course, if you say, well, okay, everything's done by small teams, but you have a giant enterprise and you have all these different products and you have marketing and sales and legal and fine. Of course you wind up with different teams focusing on different stuff. And then how do you, how do you see that, that, you know, experience, but because the customer, as you say, the customer's experience cuts across all of them. It may be like, like similar to your example. I tell a story in my book about um, one time when I was trying to return a product to Dell at Dell and I'd bought um, something and I, I went on to the online chat uh, at, on, on Dell.com to say, Hey, I bought this thing and I have a problem with it. And the guy looks up my number, my order number, and he comes back to me on chat and he says, well, the product you bought, you bought from our small business division. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, I'm like, isn't this the small business division? He says, well, no, this is the small office home office division, not the small business division. And I'm like, okay. He's like, you need to talk to the small business division. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, how do I chat with them? They're like, oh, well, they don't have chat. You have to call them. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, right. Your mind just blows, right? But you got to know, like, nobody intentionally said, would it be a good idea to have the customer have this experience? Of course not. And it may be that the small office, home office division does a great job with their stuff, and the small business division does a great. And, and nobody was thinking about these types of scenarios where the customer is in the wrong place and then needs to be moved over. And well, that's the job of CX, right? Is to see it from the customer's perspective and to realize that, you know, when in the real world, what actually happens looks like a mess, even if it looks fine on paper or in a flow chart, because that flow chart didn't always take into consideration the different paths customers take in the real world. Yes. And what a wonderful opportunity for, if bring a product manager into the room with all the different disciplines, have someone from marketing, finance, how customers pay their bill, customer service, et cetera, and have everybody together at a table to design the beginning to the end of the customer journey together. And you'd be surprised how then it becomes seamless and how people really buy in 
to how they own customer experience and really see it through and feel empowered. And that's an opportunity for companies. They don't do enough. I couldn't agree more. The truth is that customers, I mean, companies have people in their organizations that are deep experts in their customers, but they usually don't have offices. They usually work, you know, behind a cash register or their security personnel or they're working in the call center. These are the people who spend all day with the customers. And it's amazing how often choices get made, decisions get made without involving the pe by people who are, you know, executives and whatnot, and no doubt very smart in of themselves and may have tons of great experience, but who aren't spending all their time every day with customers. And of course, therefore, don't know the customer's needs and don't know all of these real world things as well as your, your people who are facing the customer every day. So I think that's a huge untapped resource at so many big companies is the depth of knowledge, especially the people, you know, I think it was Malcolm Gladwell. I can't remember which of his books he talks about experts and how once you spent 10,000 hours doing anything, whether it's you know practicing the piano or learning a sport, but that's the point at which you become an expert. So that's like five years mm -hmm. full time on something, you know. And of course, many companies, most companies have lots of people who've spent five years or more, some 10, 15. You know, I've worked with car, car rental brand, one big car rental brand I work with. You go to their locations and there's people that have been there 25 years helping people rent cars at Newark Airport or whatever. And these people really know what their customers deal with, what they deal with in the rain, what they deal with in the winter, what they deal with during the holidays, what it's like when their kids are sick or they, their flight is delayed. Blah, blah, blah. They know all of these scenarios. And man, is that a valuable asset to start incorporating that insight into whatever kind of customer experience work you're doing. Yes. And what you just described is back to that trust formula and Per, the intimacy with people really caring to get to know who they are and that I'm seeing over and over again is is not about the profit the profit comes when you actually keep it human mm. indeed indeed well great well we have just a couple minutes left so before we kind of get into our wrap up sequence you know what would be your top sort of tips to somebody who's out there working in the CX field, especially now, I feel like with, with COVID, like so much of the world has changed. Customers' needs are, have changed and they kind of almost continue to change and evolve as almost, almost every business has had to change in some ways the way they interact with their customers as a result of COVID. And so that means customers' needs have changed. Businesses are constrained in terms of how they can interact. And so to me, that only means it's like upset the apple cart in terms of even things that are already working. In this kind of somewhat chaotic customer experience world that we're in now, what would be your top tips to people out there who are trying to figure out, okay, we've just started a new year. What, what can I do that's going to have the biggest impact from a customer experience perspective on my customer and on my business in 2022? How can I figure that out? Ask your customer. It's that simple. So for your customers who tell you they're unhappy, again, back to whether it's that structured survey or interview or online, unstructured, unsolicited, either way. Talk to your customer and show them that you care about what they're saying and what they're experiencing and that you want to make it better and actually do it. Don't just say it. Likewise, when customers are praising your company, they're mentioning that man or woman that just serviced them. Take time to... Express appreciation to that employee because then they're going to do more of what's right. And so don't just focus on the bad. Use that for coaching. Celebrate the good and keep a pulse on the customer. And whatever you design in a product, in pricing strategies, you've got to test it with the customer and get real feedback Employee feedback is great, but it's not the customer. So don't, don't shortchange the process. Yeah, amen to all of that. I totally agree. 
And to the first point you made about disgruntled customers or unhappy customers or whatnot, I, I absolutely, they're, they're one of your best sources of insight. And um, I always advise companies, pay money to talk to your unhappy customers, particularly, you know, those that have left, those that have fired you as a, as a company, you know, they may not be thrilled. They may not want to give you their time. After all, you've, you've let them down. So pay them, <laughs> you know, offer them money, Amazon gift cards, whatever you need to do to get their insight. I remember we did a project once we've done this many times, but for a utility company, and we went out and talked to a bunch of customers who had left and gone to other ways of, of getting that particular utility provided. And, the, the reasons, when we heard the reasons, were very, very surprising. I mean, you, know, you could sort of bucket them in different categories, and some of them were what you'd expect, billing disputes and things like that. But then there were these other reasons that were on nobody's radar and then turned out to be patterns and trends. And so, and some of them are easily recoverable. So it's amazing. Sometimes you, you don't want to make assumptions about why your customers are unhappy. And the last thing you ever want to do, I think, is to take that mindset, which sometimes we take out of a defensive posture because we don't, we don't want to believe that we're doing something that makes customers unhappy. And so there's that mindset that's like, oh, you know, you're never going to please everybody, you know? And while I think that's perhaps true, the people that you're not pleasing, there is a reason you're not pleasing them. It's not just because they're completely unreasonable people. That's rarely the case. So it's really worth going, okay, wait a minute. If 2% of our customers are unhappy, instead of just rolling our eyes and saying they're the they're the 2% that can never be pleased. Um, you know, it could be that the 2% that you know to be unhappy actually reflect 15% who are a little bit unhappy about the same issues, but you're just not really hearing about them. And another is 20% that would be your customers if you had fixed that issue and you don't even think of them as unhappy customers because they never became customers because of this one issue. And before you know it, you've pulled that thread and realized that that 2%, you know, is a potential for re reflecting insight that could lead to huge growth in the business. So absolutely couldn't agree more that, that understanding the, uh, the unhappy customer is, uh, should be one of our number one goals in CX. Well, and, and two other quick things. One, exactly yeah. what you just said applies to your employee. How many times companies don't do exit interviews? Same things. You have to know to be able to make it a better experience and, and retain your employees just like customers. So same thing for employees. And I lost my thought. <laughs> there was an end. But yes, I think that is really, really important. And uh, now I remember my end. Silos. Stop the silos as best as possible. Because internally, that is hurting the customer experience. And it's never going to go away fully. But I think I know that when leaders are intentional – to bring everybody, the key stakeholders and influencers in the room where decisions are happening, it will be better for the customer and the employees because they'll feel more valued too. Amen. Totally agree. Well, Stacy, thank you. This has been a lot of good insight packed into 30 minutes, just as I expected. Before we go, if you could let people know if people want to learn more about you, what you do, your podcast, where should they go? What should they do? Yes, doingcxright.com has my blog, my articles, and podcast episodes, and newsletter. Please subscribe to get lots of tips about doing CX right, and thank you for having me here. Yeah, thank you, Stacy, and thanks to everybody out there for listening and watching the Winning Digital Customers podcast. As always, look forward to seeing you next time, and until then, keep transforming.